Welcome to the session on intersectionality, um, intersectionality on deep learning trial, a conversation with Tony Curry, who's here online with us tonight. A quick word about BL. We are a we're a network of individuals that comes from a way of thinking, has experienced certain things in the world, and has come together to start studying this world, analyzing it in depth, so that we can learn about it, understand it, and also learn how to engage with the world. We do this in a different variety. We have the real off film nights. They happen bi-weekly in Kilburn. Uh, the next film will probably be in two weeks. We have the Vitamin D podcast um, done by Madison Turok. There was actually a podcast done a few days ago with Tommy Curry, so if you haven't heard that yet, please check it out as well. We have a long-term study program, the DL Workspaces, that started in May. The new uh, module for that will be starting mid or end, end of September as well on decolonization. And there's other projects that we're working on that we want to get people involved with and in as well. Today, the session on intersectionality, it has come up many times in discussions or during the film night or the workspaces as well that there was confusion around this term, uh, people not knowing or using it in ways that we found really important to get back to that. So that was the reason for putting up this event. And we're hoping that this is going to be an important discussion. Everything will be recorded on audio as well, so you can share it afterwards. And come back to us, let's keep this conversation going always. Just a few things, there's drinks at the back, exits are on the side, toilets on the back as well, there'll be a break halfway, and I think that's it. Um, thanks to Waterloo, that's also really important. This is the second event that we're holding in Waterloo, and we're really, really grateful that we can do this. So, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Alright, um, um, I just want to make sure people will still trick going in. I'm sure it will take a while for the fill up. Uh, but thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Ned. I'm also part of uh, DL. I'm not from Mary Trail. I'm a refugee here. I do, do podcasts and some other things within the, within the, group, uh, within the network. Uh, a little bit more myself. As I said, I'm an immigrant. I'm a refugee from Mary Trail. The most a uh, lingering thing in my mind is uh, Black Death in the Mediterranean. That's been going on for 15 years, but has been uh, more of a hashtag, hashtag relatable uh, discussion as of late. Um, in my pursuit for a theory or conceptual analysis that will, that is worthy of their death, I've moved towards radical Black um, tradition, as many of us do. Um, part of that, I'm not going to with what I have read, is uh, Dr. Tommy J. Curry's um, uh, work, which I'm going to read from, uh, uh, from his website to introduce you to him. But he does really um, try to move away from any integrationist or reformist kind of uh, um, event that might be out there. And part of that is actually what, why he sort of fit for me and was part of the most helpful and um, rigorous uh, critic of intersectionality. Uh, I'm going to read uh, just a, something quick. Uh, has anybody heard the podcast that was done? How many people have heard about the podcast? How many people have read this article, Black Studies Not Black? That was put on the website. Can you see that doctor? Not that many hands, so... <laughs> can you hear us? <laughs> okay, so yeah, you have your work cut out for you. Okay, you have your work cut out for you. Um, the idea, maybe we did a bit short uh, notice. It's about 20 pages long, the article. Uh, it's not that we can go home with that. Uh, we did listen to the podcast, which is on the Bitcoin the London Twitter page. Um, or if you go to at bit decolonial, B I T, decolonial, that's for the podcast, that would be the latest um, post, will be the link to the podcast. So if you want to listen to an hour and a half of me and him speaking about the article and just the people in intersectionality, uh, you would um, want to go home or just stay here for the next hour or two. <coughs> so Tommy J. Curry's work spans across the various fields of philosophy. 
jurisprudence, African study, and gender study. Though trained in American and continental philosophical traditions, Terry's primary research interests are in critical race theory and African philosophy. In critical race theory, Terry looks at the work of Derek Bell and his theory of racial realism as an antidote um, to the proliferating discourses of racial idealism that continue to uncritically embrace liberalism through the incorporation of European thinkers as the basis of racial reconciliation in the United States. In African philosophy, Curry's work turns an eye towards the conceptual genealogy or intellectual history of African American thought from 1800 to the present, with particular attention towards the scholars of the American Negro Academy and the Negro Society for Historical Research. In biomedical ethics, Curry is primarily interested uh, in government recognition, the ethical limits of government intervention in the practice of medicine, and democratic potentialities that arise from collaborative doctor patient diagnosis and regenerative medicine like stem cells. Um, he's currently uh, associate professor in the Department of Philosophy in Texas A&M. So a quick word on the academic bit. So as, as the L we try to move away from the institution called the U.S. University. So for some of you who think that this is a contradiction where you speak to somebody inside the university, um, I come from a tradition that's in, that things, uh, and black right tradition anyways, that um, change comes with the tools of institutions, but it can happen inside the institution. So, and the other thing is Dr. Curry has um, really gone like overboard to actually reach out to spaces outside of the academy. He does so through, like he did with me with podcasts and um, making his articles available. He's, he's <coughs> published over 40 different articles before you write his first book. So um, that's, uh, uh, and, and um, to, to go on, uh, so, so, um, in terms of the language that we use today, I want this to be an interactive thing. There's not going to be a long lecture and then Q&A session. It will be, um, Dr. 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 Curry will try his best to move step by step and stage by stage into his uh, article, the premises that he's setting up. And we will hope to, if you have questions, objections, or comments, just raise your hand. I'll try to relay it to him. And we can, uh, we have a second mic, I think. There's a second mic? It's coming, yeah. All right, there's a second mic coming so you can speak. If you want clarifications or questions. Okay, uh, somebody take the mic. Um, so we will stop it and uh, have some breaks to actually explain things. But yeah, so we're, it's not going to be like a means little two minute Q and A at the end where nobody has to say anything. Um, so Dr. Curry, I'll move it on to you. Um, what is your? You can, I, I introduce you, but you can speak about your um, background and the different the kind of research that you can get led you to intersectionality theory. And um, what made you um, sort of go into that? You can start from there. Sure. Sure. Um, well, again, yeah, I, I, I thank everyone uh, for taking the lecture. Uh, let me begin by saying that when I was in undergrad in my advanced graduate studies, uh, I was drawn to intersectionality uh, through my relationship with Derek Bell. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on Derek Bell, who was the founder of critical race theory, and he was considered a very close intellectual mentor and friend to me before he passed. That being said, the lens that I used to evaluate intersectionality then uh, very much comes from an empirical basis, uh, despite the fact that I'm a philosopher. Uh, what I mean by that is that it draws from a racial realist tradition, something that assumes that racism is not merely an issue of ideas and discourse, but rather an organization and structural phenomenon in our society. That being said, when we look at intersectionality, uh, we saw a disjunct between the claims about privilege and the assumptions we make about the calculus of how we combine race and gender uh, versus what actually existed within the rubrics of American society. The split between this is pretty vast in the United States. Uh, for people who consider themselves intersectionality theorists, uh, people who are doing women and gender studies, or liberal arts, um, there is a way intersectionality is used as a justification for standpoint epistemology. That's a fancy way of saying that 
people who believe in intersectionality believe that the fact that they're meeting at an intersection of race and sex, or sex and class, have a certain unquestionable or legitimized knowledge base. It's still too hard for intersectionality to be used as a way to explain how different social structures like classism and racism or sexism uh, intersect. However, in that analysis, uh, there is an appeal to actual facts, actual data, uh, even qualitative data, um, that suggests that these kinds of positionalities are, in fact, real. Now, as one may surmise, the difference between the theoretical calculus uh, that's usually operate in, in women's gender studies or liberal arts and human activities more generally is sometimes at odds with the fine in social sciences. Uh, we see a big split in this regard between people like Kimberly Crenshaw and the fine of sociologists like Evan Sidney um, Catherine Hornways, or even someone like Patricia McCollins. And I'll read a small excerpt from her criticism of how standpoint this knowledge works. Um, the third disjunct that happens, which is the school of thought that I belong to, is post-intersectionality. And under post-intersectionality, there's a fundamental question of how we can trust the categories and intersections that the alleged methodology seeks to legitimize. In other words, where do we, how do we understand where race begins and ends? How do we understand what is meant by the history of gender? Today, the way that we look at these things are simply as articulations of already largely held in popular system. For example, we'll say something that if you're white, you have white privilege, and that white privilege necessarily trumps black people. So when you look at the race category within intersectionality, we know that whiteness is over blackness. Similarly, we make the same approach when we look at gender. We'll say that because patriarchy is an overarching narrative and phenomenon throughout the world's history, that anyone who is biologically male has no privilege and in that regard is above or has more power than someone who is female. Same thing with class. Um, the problem with this is that while these things may seem intuitively correct, they're not empirically correct. So there are large instances where black men in the United States, for instance, uh, do not enjoy the male privilege precisely because of the position they are uh, in racism. And that's not a general statement. That's a statement to suggest that if you compare black men to black women, black men to white women, Black men to Latinos, right? That you will find that in each one of those categories, black men are behind in a demographic area. Be it something like education, be it something like, you know, uh, job attainment, employment, um, something as basic as mortality, who dies first, falling off life. These types of things in the empirical social world don't necessarily conform to what the theoretical apparatus suggests that would be. So this creates a problem for people like me who are theorists. Do we suggest that the abstract calculus of intersectionality would suggest that we should look at multiple locations, right? Someone who says, well, we should just look at race, look at race and sex, race and class, that's fine. But the question becomes, well then, how do you dig up the phenomenon? If we compare something like black men to black women, are we doing that, that comparison on the basis of gender? And if it is gender, then are we suggesting that biological sex stands in for gender? In other words, if we suggest something like racial domination for black women has a sexual component because of rape, how do we understand and in many ways expand the category of maleness or heterosexuality, given that we know factually black women were also raped? Not only by other white men, right? So there's a whole more right aspect historically to black male rape, right? but also white women. Now, do we have to sit and embrace that for theoretical convenience? Do we suggest that, well, the, the barometer or the basis of gender uh, can't be the same because of the sex difference? In other words, do we see gender as being woman and woman being the necessary condition for rape? If we don't see that, then how do we understand the gender category? Because gender then would equal man or woman. Right, the set of actual domination would be male or female. So how do we understand the ways that we would necessitate or negotiate, right, which is probably a better word, what gender violence or sexual violence means within that intersectional context? Um, my argument has largely been that because philosophers and theoreticians are so bad at colonial history, 
that they have not truly appreciated the complexities of making these kinds of categorical assertions. And the fact of that has been that we've asserted intersectionality as a methodology that doesn't really function as a way for us to divvy up social reality, but rather as a kind of morality, which suggests that certain types of standpoints must be believed in their experience regardless of the social phenomenon that either proves or disproves their relevance. So intersectionality, for those who don't know, became popularized in the late 80s. Kimberly Crenshaw, who's actually a student of Derrick Bell, created this theory to explain race and sex discrimination under Title VII litigation. Now let me say here that while I think that it's an innovative jurisprudential theory, I think there are problems suggesting that the analog of how we look at Title VII, which is no employer should have to discriminate. Can I interrupt? I'm sorry? Can I interrupt just quickly to let people respond? I like how you – so those are sort of the basic presumptions or some of the logics of intersectionality and what Dr. Curry sees, at least from what we can gain so far, as some of the shortcomings or problematics. Does anybody want to respond to anything you said so far? For example, the standpoint of epistemology idea. Do you follow what he means by it or what Patricia O'Connor means by a standpoint of epistemology? So that was what you said at the very beginning. Just because – so for example, at the intersection of race and gender, a black woman can only – there are some experiences that only a black woman can experience as a black woman. So sometimes, like Kimberly Crenshaw says, sometimes black women experience experiences similar to black men. Sometimes they experience experiences similar to white women. But then sometimes they – and sometimes they experience a cross-section of these two. But then the fourth point is that there are some experiences that are absolutely just singular to the experience of black women. So that's what Patricia O'Connor is for as a standpoint of epistemology. If you don't have any response, can I ask Dr. Curry then, if you could – I know you want to move on to Crenshaw because that's an important start of mine. But could you explain a bit further why for perhaps in the category of race, the standpoint in terms of singularity of experience can work differently than in the category of gender? Are you following? Yes. So you – let me restate to make sure I heard you clearly. Why the standpoints of race could work differently than the standpoints of gender? Exactly. Yes. All right. Well, I think this goes back to the point I was making as to what we consider the effects of race and what we consider to be the effects of gender. By a show of hands, if a black male was raped, would you explain that by race? So how many things is racism in that black male rape? Okay, so I see about three or four hands. How many people think it would be sexual or gender violence? Okay, I see about the same number. How many people just don't know? Okay. Now let me ask you this question. Here's the easier one. If a woman is raped, is that sexual violence? Show of hands. How many people think a woman is raped is sexual violence? Right. See, this is the conceptual problem I'm trying to point out. Now, notice, it's not because the phenomenon is different. Both people are raped. The problem is that because we have a biologism that is associated with what gender is, we cannot conceptualize what rape looks like for a male. It's hard for us to understand it in terms of males raping other males. It's almost impossible for us to understand it in terms of women raping men. But imagine for a moment that we were back in colonial times, that you have actual narratives, you have experiences, you have slave narratives of boys being chained to beds, raped by their masters, of 
men giving stories about how they were the slug slave of white women so that they would be accused of rape and lynch. Now, that's history. It happened not only in the United States, but throughout South America and the Caribbean. So how do we understand the standpoint, the position of a body in terms of race and gender or race and sex when we erase or have no knowledge of the kinds of history that constitute the positionality of something like a black male? And this is the question that I'm pushing. If race and sex is an intersection of identity, then how do we know what substance, means, and histories constitute that position? Said differently, for those of you who didn't raise your hand or don't know, if you're using intersectionality to describe something like black men, or even indigenous men, right, who were considered to be children sexual playthings of, of early colonizers, then how would you know which category to place upon their bodies? And this is the intuitive problem. That intersectionality leaves unquestioned. It simply works with the assumption that certain bodies, female bodies, are gendered. Male bodies are not gendered, or if, or if they conceive that it's gendered, it's gender different. So when black men try to explain their position, when indigenous men try to explain their position, when migrant men and boys, right? Think about the boys who are killed in Africa who are raped by US soldiers. Right? Think about the boys who are raped in prison. That is a sexual violence, but that violence is denied to them under the rubric of sexuality or gender because of their males. Right, so then how does the category sorry, so sorry, expand how we social not sorry. in fact constrain? Sorry, Dr. Curry. I'm gonna I know you're gonna sorry, sorry, I right. know you wanna go off, but I wanna give people time to digest. Does that make sense? So the people who said I don't know. Do you have an inkling? Do you want to say something? Uh, microphone, microphone, somebody had a mic. So there's a question from the audience, just for clarification, Dr. Absolutely. Black men being raped is racial violence. 
then do we even see this erotic or sexual aspect of this violence that happens? So would their sexuality, in fact, be redundant? If they're correct that rape and sexual molestation, abuse, castration are all phenomena of racism, then what does the gender component add? Or does it only add something if you're a woman? But then if gender only means female, then that seems to be a body politic, not a category of analysis. Okay. Yeah, yes. Um, I'm going to try to add to that, and there's another question. So basically, if a black man is lynched, is he lynched because he's black, but, he's also, but also because he's a, a male? Right? What, what kind of violence attracts itself to him because he's a him, a he, rather than a she? Right? So yes. And so these, are, these are just basic examples. This could apply to any category of person. But using the example of males, I think it's very interesting given that intersectionality is kind of situated on that gender binary between male and female. Right? Okay. So lynching is, in America, uh, happened as a kind of sexual violence. Uh, most black men were castrated. Uh, sometimes they were burned. Sometimes they were eaten. Uh, many times their genitalia was kept as trophies. Uh, this is, of course, David Marriott's uh, point, right? Uh, not only in terms of photography, but as physical trophies. Uh, so how do we understand that aspect? Do we understand it as a category of race or do we understand it as a category of gender? And as such, how does it change? Okay, I'm going to take two. No bodies versus people. I'm going to take two comments or questions, uh, one here and then there, and maybe you could um, answer both of them or respond to both of them. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I really is that working? Yeah. I really un I understand that you're trying to get rid of the vagueness that comes along with that comes with intersectionality, which is I think often when we talk about um, violence and I mean as you just as you just highlighted, then we're not actually sure what we're talking about, where the transition happens, that where the contours end of one, of one concept and where the, the next um, contours begin of another concept. Um, so that was, I think, really important. But then I was thinking, and we were talking about um, um, heteronormativity, and I was thinking, well, actually, like, when the state subjects black people to violence or people of color to violence, then, um, then then it does actually operate with heteronormativity. So the question is, so the question is regardless of, um, or not the question, but the comment that I want to make is basically, and that's something that queer theorists have tried to point out too, um, regardless of how people identify, um, the state sees people along, according to heteronormative concepts. And that's, I think, important in analyzing or in like, identifying the kind of violence that happens. Do you get that? Um, actually, yeah, I'm gonna hold up and then uh, there's a second comment. Or okay, no, no, no. that's the only comment. Uh, the state already assume, um, the the violence uh, of the state is already has a normative uh, basis. Then um, then how do we yeah, how, how do we respond in terms of uh, what, when you add heteronormativity into it or the assumption of it? Isn't the state already operating at a level of uh, at a heteronormative violence? Well, if, if I heard your question correctly, the question is, regardless of the concept, there's already a state of violence. And then violence occurs with different causalities of these bodies anyway, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, but... Go ahead. That's correct, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But so, notice, notice the move you just made conceptually there, right? We move from a system of whether or not intersectionality accurately describes the motivations and categories, say, the state or the perpetrator uses to identify certain bodies, to the effect of the violence on the bodies regardless. So, and notice the conflation there. One, one suggests that because of something like race and sex, they attack black female bodies with a certain kind of violence that we call rape, right? In the other case, the same violence happens. So the same phenomenon happens to black men historically, even today. But then we don't associate the causality with, even though the violence happens. So then I'm going to ask the question, well then what is the upshot of the method? Because the method of intersectionality seems to have a discriminatory function, where the exact same violence happens to two different bodies, but then it can't empirically show the differentiation in the cause. So if men are raped, if transsexuals are raped, 
if women are raped and therefore and they all seem to have this component in common, then what does gender uniquely offer us in terms of causality? What intellectual work does it do for us except to let allow us to draw arbitrary round, you know, lines around the subject that we pick? And that's what I'm trying to show. That as a methodology, it cannot replicate the idea. It can't explain causally or empirically the kind of phenomena it claims is the result of gender and race. Rather, what it does is it describes it because it chooses that subject. So if I choose, for example, this is how it works in the States. The reaction that lots of black feminists have to my work is that they say that it focuses on black men. Right? And this isn't me just because I only focus on straight black men. I have to focus on all things. Because history shows us that sexuality is not just a very cut, beat, and dry thing when you're in colonial society when you're enslaved. Somehow white people have a way of making you whatever they want. Right? So given that reality, despite the fact that I'm using very historical, empirical, and conceptual analysis of all types of black men, from homoeroticism to polyamory to all these different you know, variants, right? The argument is that because I study men, I embrace women. Now notice the work, the category of intersectionality does there. It's not that I actually do erase women in any conceptual or empirical schema, but it's that I pick a subject that the other that the other intersectionality theorists did pick. And that means that they create that it creates a moralizing lens for how we look at social phenomena rather than studying social phenomena and seeing the at-large effects. In other words, I can suggest that one of the components of racism is eroticism, be it heteroerotics or homo. And from that, I can create a theory that explains the phenomena not just for women, not just for trans or queer or queer people, but also for straight people. And if I look at how erotics functions and the circumstances and the symbols historically of it, I can get a better analysis, a richer and more competent analysis of intersectionality. Right? Because unlike intersectionality, I don't have to draw the line before I even get to the subject. I can just study the subject and say, well, these things have these things in common. Okay. So if that's the case, I'm, I'm trying to find out, and no one's never really the answer to this, what work does the category do in terms of causality? Okay, um, I think you already touched on some of the um, post intersectional um, um, concepts that are coming out of your work and others. Um, mm -hmm. I cut you off during the comments. If there's no comments now, then we just move on to where he stopped uh, in terms of Kimberly Kirchhoff's work, uh, which is our work. Yeah, and uh, which is largely seen as kind of the the beginning of uh, the approach of the concept, which is, comes out of a critical race theory school. By the way, somebody online apparently said they didn't like the title to say because uh, how can you put, how can you criminalize um, uh, something that came out of U.S. black feminists who are already hyper criminalized? Okay, so okay, say that part again. They didn't like the title because. Yeah, so somebody made a comment, I didn't read it myself, I'm not on Facebook, but somebody read it to me saying that we don't, um, that there was an objection to the title because you are criminalizing, because by saying putting on trial, criminalizing a, a group of uh, black women who fought tooth and nail and uh, to actually uh, uh, to bring forth this idea and who are also, it happens to be one of the most hyper criminalized uh, communities in the States. Well, but my, 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 my answer to that would be, um, what I and, and Curry can expand on that because it's, it's to do with the moralizing that we can. Intersectionality is a method, and so is the coloniality. And if well, this is, if, 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 if I think this points to what, what my concern. Wait, 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 that's great. That's great. We, um, um, you can you can include this into your comment on Crenshaw. I just want to, no, I just want to be uh, clarify why the title I put up the title that way. Decoloniality as yeah. a as a method of the oppressed should be able to have an, an intramural or or an in group conversation with other um, theories, especially if they come out of a particular context. Whereas the colonial no, no. yeah, has a more broad um, context. And it's really um, uh, the idea that decoloniality and oppressed people's uh, method could criminalize another another people, which are often the same people. At the same level as the state or white supremacy is not 
I think the same thing. So wow. if 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 it could have been done better, I agree. Okay, it could have been done better. But I also wanted to um, bring two things into conversation. Yusuf wants to say something. I think you're. I think uh, there's you're a comment. Right? There's, there's um, a comment. Maybe after. Okay. After after Curry responds to that, uh, Yusuf will make comment. Yeah. Or you want to do now? You want to do now? Do now. Okay. All right, Doctor. Just respond to that. That was. You don't have to speak on the title of choice. It's just. Uh, I just had to mention that because I remember. Um, and sure. And, yeah. You can go on with uh, Crenshaw's uh, formulation of right. concept. And well, I'll let me stop. Let me leave you here. Um, this is what I mean when I when I began speaking about the critical race theory in the United States splitting into two different aspects of study. Um, the first aspect of racial realism is heavily empirical. It's a historical materialist account. It's interested in structures, history, economics. The latter segment is the idealist approach, which is interested in things like representation and discourse. Now, Kimberly Crenshaw's work from 1989 uh, comes on the back of a post-structuralist movement in the United States, meaning that, that the ways that we started to talk about racism um, became very much entwined with concepts of, of dialogue, discourse, and identity. That means that how we think about racism in regards to the material effects, poverty, racism, in terms of how it affects black bodies, are not the central concerns of study. Now, what Crenshaw was doing was trying to explain how under Title VII litigation, a single axis approach of racism excluded gender. In other words, she said that people who were litigating as a black woman within the system had to choose between racism and had to choose between sexism. And that seems to be a very apt description if you're talking about Title VII. However, if you take that rubric out of Title VII, what well, well, Title VII does not carry what law they work that way, what well, well, is society in large way? Dr. Curry, the answer to that is of course no. Dr. Curry, what is Title VII? We're speaking to a British population. So what is Title VII? Title VII. Ah. Title VII uh, was part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It made the discrimination in the workplace illegal on the basis of race, sex, religion, or national orientation. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. No, okay. Oh no, no. That's a, that's a great clarification. Now, notice, notice. So this was a policy that was that came out of the back of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Okay. All right. And okay. in the 1980s, late 80s, Kimberly Crenshaw was trying to figure out well, what's missing from how we can understand and can include different legal subjects under the law. But because we're interested now in dissociate empirical realities from what we take to be the study of racism, intersectionality became an umbrella term to kind of know how we speak about the suffering and discrimination of black women. Now, post-intersectionality theorists like people, people like you, Juan, immediately came to the rescue here to say, well, look, right, if you if you're trying to move away from a single axis category where racism means black men, then what's the difference between saying, okay, race and gender means black women? So he wrote an article called The Cosynthesis of Categories that really tried to challenge Kimberly Crenshaw's articulation, saying that this is not, in fact, a new method. This is just a description or a new way to express the legal positionality of black women based on race and sex. He challenges her because he says, notice, you do not try to intervene into the ways that we explain other subjects. In other, in other words, you're not saying that white women's positionality is racial and sexual. You're not saying black men's positionality is racial and sexual. You're holding that marker of race and sex specifically for the position of black women. Now, the idea that this has today in the United States Academy is very ambiguous. Uh, in the most recent text, uh, Toward Phil of Intersectionality Studies, Theory Application and Practice, uh, the authors of that anthology even concede that intersectionality is best framed not as a method, but an analytic sensibility. If intersectionality is an analytic disposition, 
a way of thinking about and conduct analyses, then what makes an analysis intersectional is not its use of the term intersectionality, nor its being situated in a familiar genealogy, nor its drawn on a list of citation. Rather, what makes an analysis intersectional, whatever terms it deploys, whatever its duration, whatever its field or discipline, is its adoption of an intersectional way of thinking about the problem of sameness and difference and its relation to power. Now notice, notice the kind of tautological sentiment there. Intersectionality is intersectional ways of thinking. But what are intersectional ways of thinking if we're trying to define intersectionality? Okay? This is the problem. Because there's this assumption, right? And this is that intuitive aspect that I was speaking about. There is an assumption that intersectionality focuses or rather formulates itself as in a brief one moral lens about the world. This is why you have intuitive sentiments about intersectionality, which suggests that any disagreement with it is a silencing or marginalization of the speaker. But even within intersectionality circles, you have disagreements. For example, Patricia Hill Collins' book, Black Feminist Thought, Knowledge, Consciousness, and the Policy of Empowerment, in its first iteration, seemed to support the idea that there was a standpoint theory that only black women had. However, by her second book, Look, Fighting Words, Collins argues this about standpoint epistemology. This is very important. That standpoint theory alone cannot explain black women's experiences. Despite the overtly claimed and clearly stated eclecticism of my own work, I remain amazed at repeated efforts to categorize my ideas in one theoretical framework or another. Joe, without full knowledge of the scope of my work, interpret this approach and classify works as a shortcut to the other social phenomenon. Grounded in certain reason, one identifies what one perceives as the essence of one approach, classifies thinkers and their works in those categories, and then accepts or rejects ideas based on one's initial classification. Now, the question of Collins is especially worth this footnote. Dr. Curry, about the use of Collins. Sorry, we lost you for a second there. Could you summarize Collins' point just to repeat it because we missed it? Sure. Collins' point is that standpoint epistemology is a circular argument because you identify what you take to be the basis of your experience, and then you read everything through that. In other words, if I suggest that patriarchy is the overarching lens of the world history, then everything that a male biological body does is patriarchal. Notice this is the pause that people like Judith Butler have put on feminist studies in her book, Gender Trouble. That you can't look for examples, but you have to rather look for cultural and social phenomena. Okay. I'm going to allow Yusuf to make his comment, and then also, is everybody following, or do they want more clarification? I'm just getting kind of deep. I might pose a question to him for you, because I want to, like, I don't know. I think intersectionality has done good for me, but I think it hasn't done good enough for those dead people in the Mediterranean that I talked about. Now, that might be like a jump for some people, like I'm trying to make this thing, what I say stuff like, how did intersectionality save my auntie's best friend on the boat? And I do these things because I get angry really quick. So my point about intersectionality is I accept it because it comes out of the same tradition, the rich tradition that I actually go to all the time. But I also think we can do better, and we can go beyond it. So what I would ask Dr. Curry is, after Yusuf, is to kind of bring things a bit closer, because it is becoming like a spiraling thing where people just keep going. It's more complicated. Yusuf. Dr. Curry, there's a question. Just speak up, yeah? Basically, I think I want to bring it back to the title of the letter for intersectionality on trial, and link that to basically can you touch on what kind of how she's dealing with how black women have basically come about on trial, like so when they were in court, and like how the state envisioned or like how the state fantasy fantasizes about black women, I guess, right? So how do we basically differentiate between the ways in which Kim Kim Henshaw talks about intersectionality and the way that it's been misread in mainstream 
um, ways of thinking so that it becomes more about less about like, um, the category of analysis that you're talking about and less, uh, and less about intersectional thinking and more about intersectional being. So that it's um, more about claims of injury happening across many different spectrums. So that, um, so that, so that, so for instance, you're claiming injury as a black woman who's working class who's this, who's that. You're claiming injury as a white woman who's this, who's this, who's that. Like, so, do you know what I'm, you know what I'm trying to say in terms of like this thing, all the things that you are? So, um, so how do we basically, basically what I'm trying to say is that there, there is a complete, I feel there's a complete difference in, um, the way that human potential talks about it and the way that the mainstream, the way that we store the reputation as a general. Okay. Do you think that? Yeah. Do you, do you get that out okay. there? Yeah, it's kind of one of the echo kept changing. Okay. So, is the question so how do you we differentiate between Kevin Crenshaw's understanding of intersectionality and mainstream uses of it, such as we start talking about intersectional being? Exactly. So, how do we account for the diversity of any sub given subject um, when we are talking about the mis- when we're focused on, we're focusing on the misreading of Kimberly Crenshaw's uh, initial argumentation in the mainstream? Well, I think, I think this is what makes it complicated. So, as a scholar, I'm interested in what Crenshaw actually said and whether or not it works, right? Um, I think there's sufficient evidence empirically to suggest that it does. Now, the second question of, of... I'm sorry? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, the second aspect of how it's being taken up by the mainstream, whether that's been misinterpretation or not, uh, I think that's something that scholars and critical thinkers have to analyze. For example, this really does bring us to, to, the, to the question of the title, right? If we, if we think that putting intersectionality on trial necessarily means that you're invalidating the contributions of black women, then how do we start questioning this? Is, notice this is what Patricia O'Connor has argued about in terms of standpoint. It's the argument that because it comes from a certain group or population, in this case black women, that the thoughts that come from that group can't be questioned because we value black women. That seems to be another explanation for Don Parr's censorship of why the idea is a priori true rather than being empirically true, right? So what I, what I would suggest is that there is actually no time in human history where human beings have articulated a philosophy or concept of themselves that wasn't what we would call intersection. If we even look back to the time period of investigation that intersectionality theory was talking about, we would see that even in the black power movement, black people, even black men, describe themselves in a myriad of ways. For example, one of the basic assumptions of black power was that we live in a colonial or semi-colonial state. Being that despite the informal colonialism and imperial powers, black people in America still live as colonial subjects who were exploited for labor. Now, this kind of thought dates all the way back to the mid 1850s within the National Negro Convention movement as well as the immigration movement, right? People like Mark Delaney, uh, people like Sudan and Bruce, right? These big immigrations. Yet, we don't call that intersection. Why? Black people, specifically black males, but black women like Claudia Jones as well, describe themselves not only as black as well as sex, but also within the category of work, specifically exploited work. Yet we don't seem to moralize the economical or the Marxist account of how black people thought of themselves in different ways as either colonial subjects, or as worker, or as male, or as slave, right? This is the thing with Afro-Pessimism now, right? The position that black people are still the slave. We don't describe any of these things as intersectional. So what is it about the category of woman slash gender that suddenly makes all the previous analyses not intersectional, but you can take the exact same analysis of a woman in it and suddenly it's intersectional? How do we, how do we account for that phenomenon? Okay, there are some questions and some comments. Uh, first, to Yusuf, the person who just asked the question, wants to respond. <laughs> no, I have another question. Basically, like um, I want to talk more about the categories. Um, so the category of women itself, um, and whether you think basically that because uh, you keep saying women, but I'm just wondering whether you actually think that black women even fit into the category of women to begin with, right? So it's kind of important. like, do you think we should instead of thinking on the category, we should be thinking more about how um, blackness in and of itself, or racialization, kind of makes people um, non-conforming to the 
the, the gender yeah, gender, 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 gender right? So and how then do we talk about gender within that? Does that make sense? So you could, you could, did you get that? Uh, so basically, it's, it's, so it's, that's it's, not being seen as women, and that's the point. That we're yeah, so that, that we're not necessarily tackling. Uh, we talked about this. We talked about this bit in the podcast. So basically, under the condition of anti-blackness, so to speak, how can we even speak of black women as women? Um, because the, the title historically did not um, right. them, right? So we spoke about this. Um, the, the second, yeah. So, so you, uh, hold that thought. And the second one was last one. Uh, Mike, Mike Trump. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Second comment. I think the point that I want to make is a bit about um, the broader feminist movement and the Black Power movement, and how um, often Black women were kind of caught between these two kind of there were two camps where you can either go for Black nationalist, we call you Black nationalist, Black empowerment movements. Or then you can go towards like the women's movement, which is much more about integration to the state. Then you have the black power movements, which like the state can't do anything for us. And I think in maybe intersectionality um, as a theory kind of sits more towards this integrationist women um, kind of equality type discourse. And maybe that's kind of where um, these antagonisms begin because it's like, well, is everything called patriarchy? then the experiences, the kind of interpersonal violence between black women and black women must be there for patriarchal in the way that white women and white women's experiences are. But there's a completely different dynamic. And kind of points to what you said about different ideas of gender, that non-white people and black people are not gendered in the same way that white people are gendered. And um, I think maybe what I want you to maybe speak to a bit more about those discussions. I think we got that. I missed part of it. Yeah, so we were the, the beginning part is we should think about how in the during specifically during the period of the black power movement, you had the phenomenon of black women feeling like they're trapped between two camps. It's either black power nationalists or kind of white feminist integrationism. Um, and, and within that context, intersectionality kind of leans towards the integrationist side of it. Um, and she, uh, she returned us to the previous comments of how gender historically, basically, doesn't um, never apply to black women under conditions of slavery and racism anyways. So can we speak about different conceptions of gender um, and kind of expand and problematize the very term black woman? Right. Um, well, let me say, let me say that uh, I think the last part of your question is absolutely correct. Uh, gender is a European construct uh, that was not afforded to chattel slaves. Uh, the people who do great work on this, uh, Vincent Woodard, um, you know, Derek Scott makes this point in his book, um, Extravagant Objection, uh, actually Maria Lewis, uh, Toward a Decolonial Feminism, and of course Sylvia Winter uh, makes this point as well. Um, I think the problem is, is that when we use colonial categories or disciplinary ways, to speak about history as if they always apply, then each time you say that something has always been true, but that another doesn't maintain as a social construct, you have a problem with social continuity, right? That, that somehow these concepts are constructed within certain cultural and social milieu, but somehow that social milieu has existed since the beginning of time. Uh, the reality is in slavery, there were not genders for colonizers or enslaved people. Um, that being said, I, I think that's something much as notion of genre. Uh, I think Huey P. Newton's notion of the exploited, I think these concepts all do work that capture, even Fanon's notion of aggression, right? These concepts all do work that capture what we're trying to express by intersectional analysis. Um, I would, however, disagree with the split between the, your account of black nationalism and women's liberation, uh, because you have to remember that there isn't the same kind of overlap historically of those movements that people anticipate. So you're not getting the notion or even the criticism that black nationalism doesn't include black women until the late 1970s. But black power was founded in October of 1966. So you have almost, you have over a full decade of black women 
not only participating in black power or the Black Panther Party, if, if that's if we want to see those two things as synonymous, but we do a long history of the civil rights movement, then we arguably have black women and black power since the turn of the century, right? But let's let's assume that we're just talking about black power in terms of black panthers, then even in that movement, black women were the majority of black panthers. In fact, there's been work by people like Linda Lusden, uh, who's a journalist out in the United States, uh, that catalogs the difference and changes um, in the Black Panther magazine from 1968 forward. And she shows that you have more black women as editors, you have more black female representations that are much more liberal and progressive and politically empowering than anything you get out of the first decade of the women's liberation movement. And Kathleen Cleaver specifically has uh, responded to this phenomenon, saying that when people read his, the, the historiography of the black power movement through black feminist lens, they usually miss that there were no revolutionary organizations. So they assume that black women, even though they're the majority of the Black Panther Party, were somehow both coerced into the party and had no agency to change the party. And she says that that's one of the greatest mistakes that President Day gender theory has because it doesn't understand the dialectics of history whereby the exchange between black women and black men within the Black Panther Party led to concrete changes in representation and political power. You see the same, the very same type of explanation should come out of Mabel, Mabel Williams' account. Uh, she was one of the early black power advocates because her husband was Robert F. Williams who wrote the text Negro with Guns. So even as a woman there, you can actually look at her, her statement on this with Catherine Cleaver um, on the Mayo. Uh, they had, in 1995, they did a session on what did black power mean for black women, now you think of it, you know, several decades later. And she actually straight out says that the gender question had to be taken within the context of the revolutionary question. And that those questions when answered by the women that were in these revolutionary parties look very different than what gender theory and black feminist historiography renders. Right? Because you have to remember that black women in the United States have been participating and have been leading movements for over 150 years by this point. The problem with gender theory is it only starts black female political uh, activity in exclusion. It doesn't talk about it in terms of leadership. So if you look even at the 1930s, it's sort of like Matt Gordon, right, who leads the largest black nationalist organization organized by a woman after Marcus Garvey's UNIA movement. You see that black women were largely on board with both immigration's power um, programs and with straight up nationalist and race based programs, right? So how do we how do we reconcile if, if black women feel excluded by the category of race? And how do we have 100 years of black women advocating race as their political positionality to speak about how they do work as race women, right? And I think that we have to we have to nudge the historiography and the history with the historical record on that account. Okay. Is that okay? Can we move on? Yeah? Okay. Um, I kind of forgot where we stopped. But what, what, my idea was to pose a question um, in terms of intersectionality because of its um, kind of inherent flexibility kind of can take in with the criticisms that you're making, especially the point about heteronormativity. So if there have been blind, or blind spots, then all you have to do is add another category and kind of uh, right. change the picture. So intersectionality is inherently infallible because it is flexible enough because it already assumes diversity in categories and the diversity diversity in uh, hierarchies within those categories. So, does that make sense? Yeah. Right? I mean, I'm looking to you guys, does that make sense? Like, intersectionality can actually um, absorb all of these new categories that you're talking about and then change the calculus. I right? also, somebody like yourself who was over here, and this, on this axis is actually up in here, and this one introduced a new axis, and then maybe somewhere here again. So, it's, it's flexible, right? Do you, um, do you get that question, Curry? Yes. Um, I, again, I think, I think this is where, you know, this is where it becomes a moral sensitive rather than a, uh, if we're, if the argument is that any theory can encapsulate everything without contradiction, mm -hmm. uh, then we move from theoretical accounts and how that theory explains social phenomena or reality to how we should simply believe the theory and use it as a lens to view everything. Uh, think of it in terms of how we look at, uh, even religious texts like the Bible. 
Uh, someone can always find something that resonates with some aspect of history, some example, some phenomenon that they think that the Bible speaks to. Uh, my fear is that intersectionality has to start to move in that category. Uh, that is something that cannot be questioned. It's something that is supposed to apply to everyone. It's something that everyone should uh, admit to supporting you because if they criticize it, then they're simply condemned for being immoral. And when I say moral, substitute words like patriarchal, sexist, hegemonic, your white privilege is shown, your male privilege is shown, right? These become the words that we use in popular discourse or in, in this country on black Twitter uh, to suggest that the people who don't agree with us don't actually have a substantive point, but rather are just immoral and flawed speakers. Uh, one of the things that I think happens, and this is a uh, thing of Tula's point, is that any criticism of intersectionality uh, doesn't get handled as if it's a criticism. They just look at it as an, a way to improve the theory. So when intersectionality didn't speak about sexual orientation, guess what, now it speaks about sexual orientation. When it didn't speak about disability, guess what, now it speaks about disability, right? But when you ask yourself this fundamental question, what is the intersection of race and sex? And that black woman comes to your mind. The question you have to ask, is that black woman able-bodied? Is she poor? Is she rich? Is she educated? Is she Western? Is she Southern, right? These kinds of questions of positionality cannot be given a name in intersectionality because intersectionality expects the very category to present the image in your mind. So the arguments that people have, even, even some of the questions, and I think these are great questions, are based on the assumption that there is an intuitive subject present in how we account for intersectionality. Uh, especially the last question, which I thought was very, very good about whether or not black people felt out of place between women's liberation and black and black Catholic party, right? Th that question presupposes automatically that we're talking about black women. So is it is it the case? That in the way we conceptualize the social world, that all marginalizations have not had some sort of effect. So think think about the cat the most hegemonic category we can. Like what if someone had to say, well, what's the most powerful subject in history? Who would that be? Should I say it for you? <laughs> White, male, heteronormative, uh, middle class, able-bodied. Straight and then right. cis, cis, yeah, cis, straight. You getting all that? Yeah, yeah, right. right. So, so you know, the cis, cis, the cis, yeah. the middle class, yeah. white double, right? But is is that an intersectional being? Yeah. They're saying yes. Is a, is a cis middle class or rich white male intersection? Yes. They're all intersections. They're saying yes. Affirmative. They're all intersectional. Affirmative. Right? How many people? How many people say yes? He's intersectional. <laughs> this person that you just described is right intersectional. How many people say no? No, why? The, the cis is not intersectional. Whoa! One. Everybody, two, three. It's the same space. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> You see, this, this is what I'm trying to point out. Your, your assessment of that question is not analytic. The battle you're asking yourself is whether or not white men or white women can be intersectional because they're not black women, because it's not race sex. You see, this, this is what we're doing when we're thinking about these categories. And what I'm trying to suggest to us is that we need a pre critical or pre intersectional reflection to decide what we're actually talking about. Because it's not very clear. It's not clear in the literature. It's certainly not clear in the, in the popular parlance of how we express intersectionality. And it's not clear in the consequence or the effects of the bad ethic. Right? Is it intersectional? So, yeah, I think there's a question. Yeah. So, um, so that the male uh, wife always, is it intersectional? Like the band, I didn't get your answer. So could you please repeat the explanation of why it's intersectional or not? So, so yeah, you want clarification on that 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 um that example? What's your answer, Doctor Curry? Is he intersectional or not? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. 
Okay, do you want to uh, expand or? No? <laughs> There's a question here on the front side. Okay. Um, the light level is intersectional because if intersectionality is about the combination of different characteristics that give one social being, then to be a rich white male is different than being a middle class white male, is different than being a poor white male, is different than being a white male who was a libertine, than a white male who was a slave, right? All these different categories matter concretely in terms of their social position culture. Many people don't even know that back in the 1800s, it was poor white men and their theories to justify class mobility that created the very notions that black people like Anna Judy Cooper used to justify racial uplift. So in other words, if you were back up to the 19th century, the idea that black people can improve themselves, the, black, the idea that black people were more than one thing, and that they weren't biologically determined, wasn't just an intersectional ideal created by black women, wasn't just a racial ideal created by black people, but rather it was an idea that was amongst various classes in American society, like poor white men, who wanted to show, and in Britain, y'all should get this in your classes, right? That people of lower classes were not culturally inferior or biologically inferior to the upper classes. A very similar phenomenon happened in America. And guess what? Those black people, like Du Bois, like Glenn Hope Barnes, like Andrew Cooper, were paying attention to how biological determinism was giving way to something we call sociology in the 1900s. And this meant that races could change, that societies could grow. So if we look at intersection, intersectionality as expressing certain types of social being, and when we look historically about what that being means and how it's positioned, we see that there's a vast array of how those categories not only overlap with the thinking of other groups, but in many ways facilitate the thinking of other groups. So if we say something like white men, rich, middle class, able bodied white men are not intersectional, notice what we're doing. We're saying that they're outside of the operation of these forces, like race, class, et cetera, because they're at the top. Without understanding that historically, those forces like maleness or like, you know, no, the turn of the century, white man's burden or classism, right? All affected the way that black people have historically defined themselves and you use utilize some of the theories to do so. So I think that if we're going to say that intersectionality is about categories that create and justify or legitimate social positions or even standpoints, then absolutely the white male has to be part of that despite being at the top or towards the upper end of the hierarchies that we have in various societies. Just, just because you're at the top of the structure doesn't mean you're not affected by the structure. And again, this is why I say that there's a moralizing aspect about how intersectionality points to subjects rather than the categories that explain social phenomena. Okay. Um.
Are you, are you okay, Doctor? Do you have time? Oh, fine. Oh, fine. Okay, cool. So, and the, the, if you could clarify that example, especially given what we know, that this person, this, this being uh, sits at the top, whether we're talking about 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, or now, um, can you explain why you gave that example? Because particularly what, you know, pertaining to intersectionality, what's the point that you're trying to make? And then after that, we sure. move on to the, the um, critiques of intersectionality from black women post Kimberly Crenshaw. And also from um, uh, some of the kind of forgotten black women scholars who came, uh, who contributed to uh, revolutionary thought before and so. So, can you just clarify that first one? Sure, sure. Um, the point the point I'm trying to make there is that the effect of how we categorize the white man uh, should not be based on how we think about the social identity of the white man but rather where that white man fits on these structures that serve as the foundation of a society. So I can say both that the white man is intersectional and then say that the reasons that he has certain power as a rich, able-bodied white male, and in the 1800s, Christian would be necessary that as well, was because you have a religious or theological basis that becomes synonymous with civilization. That you have a class base, which becomes synonymous to evolution. That you have a race base, a racial basis, that becomes uh, categorized in terms of where you fit on the, the modalities of humanity, right? That's what those categories point to. And I can easily transfer that analysis to how have they evolved today? So in the United States, for example, with the rise of police brutality, I can show that systems of racism, of anti-blackness, of class positionality, right? Because over, uh, an overwhelmingly large amount of poor people, specifically poor black people, but even poor white people, are shot in this country by police. So it suggests that class does not necessarily override how we think of race. Even though under our common use of gender sexuality, we think of white men practically and normal. But in reality, sociologically speaking, they deal with the same phenomenon that poor black men in this country deal with. Albeit we don't expect, explain in terms of race, we explain in terms of class. But it's the same phenomenon, right? If intersectionality happens, right? If intersectionality is about how we identify certain power relations, then we have to answer the question. We can say, well, white men are killed by police because of class, but again, where does it, where does it begin again? Is it only class? Right? And if it's, if it's class, then why does that phenomenon happen differently with black people? What well, race? So now you have Class of one and needs police brutality, the class of race needs police brutality, and then you put the black woman that was class, race, and gender, right? The categories just multiply based on how we explain the subject, which suggests that we're not analyzing the phenomenon, we're analyzing the subject we're talking about. It's the same phenomenon, right? So that's why we need to nuance, and that's why I think the example of why the white man is intersectional being based on social phenomenon and social position and historical cultural interactions are the best way to do so. Okay, uh, we have a comment or a question. I, that's a very quick question. I just wondered if you would, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, but I just wondered if you would consider access as part of your social analysis. Um, access? And, yeah, access. I mean, you talked about white men, white men, right? And white men have historically had uh, wider access to um, resources. Um, they have had uh, better access to resources of the state that are, available, that are made available by the state. And therefore, um, I would say, of course, you know, white men are privileged over black men. And therefore, yeah, I just wondered if you consider that as part of your own kind of work. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, sir. My work actually makes that argument. The argument I make here about structure is an argument that one has to re access to resources and power within a society. So that's why I can say something like, even though white men are intersectional, at a structural level, white supremacy, at least in the Western world, operates so that within any class division or gender division, white people will be more superior to any black person, right? So it's because of how the structure of the society operates, not because of the abstract calculus that we adopt to explain that society, that we get that we get the outcome. For example, now, in the United States, and I'm sure this is, the, this is the same situation throughout most of Europe, white women are the second highest paid group in terms of wealth and income. Is that the case for the UK? Hell yes. Right. Now, ask yourself this question, 
right? Why is that? So when, when America, when Europe, right, when Britain, Portugal, all these places, went to colonize places, did they bring their women in at the same status as the savages are native people? Yes or no? No, of course not, right? So that means that the organizing structure of colonialism and racism does something to gender so that white gender, right, and not just the racial component, but the history of colonialism suggests something about the status of womanhood such that that womanhood is greater than any kind of manhood the native could ever conceptualize, right? How do we explain that in an intersection line? If we just call it race, then how do we understand the interactions between white women and black men? Right? If, in other words, if we can't conceptualize that white women lynch black men, participate in colonialism, and rape black men, is that just a racial category of work? Of course not. Right? There's something else going on there. So the question of power, the question of domination in history, are very real barometers in terms of how we can get to the outcome that we're trying to talk about when we use intersectional analysis. Does that make sense? Uh, can, I, can I just kind of quickly butt in, because this is uh, an example I quote, uh, Denise Ferrer Silva, who is a black uh, scholar. She's critiqued Kimberly Crenshaw very succinctly in a footnote of her book, The Fourth Global Idea of uh, Race. She says, for example, when Kimberly Crenshaw is theorizing intersectionality, she's trying to differentiate between the specific um, experiences of black women, usually white women, which means uh, in the provisions given out by the state, there's a discrepancy there, so you can't lump us in with white women. So the thesis critique is, uh, Professor Lissot's critique is, that this, this method, although it's trying to think through race and gender, is still thinking through uh, the provis uh, provisional um, kind of um, um, politics vis-a-vis -vis state, but still speaking to the state and under the state. She's not, there's not even a radical impetus in the very idea of Crenshaw, for her credit, is trying to describe different experiences. Uh, there are other black women who say, okay, but we still speak to the state in terms of provisions uh, that, uh, that are uh, meted out differently to different people. And um, what the Silva's project is, is way beyond the state. She's going at the level of the human, uh, like Silver Winter, uh, and so on and so forth. So the, um, that, that would be like my kind of quick... Uh, and, um, and that's, and that's the difference between one yeah, so, so, yeah. apparatus and a serious study of the philosophical anthropology behind the human. Uh, intersectionality, as, as I wrote in the article of Black Studies on Morality, still relies on your sacred categories like man, human, woman, right? These categories that we believe should be questioned in our social constructs somehow become something more when we're deploying intersectional analysis. Okay. Right? So this was one of the early criticisms that people like Darren Hutchinson uh, had of Kimberly Crenshaw's theory. Darren Hutchinson, for example, used, I, mean, I think this is a very rich example, says that if you look at heterosexual stereotypes of black males, uh, you get a kind of sexualized racism that's endured indicated by something like lynching. And, and even though he's both male and heterosexual, that kind of notion of the myth of the black rapist that leads to lynching, that leads to incarceration and police brutality, cannot be considered to be an advantage even though it's heterosexual one man. So notice what Hutchinson is doing. Hutchinson is arguing that you've created an abstract calculus and says if you're heterosexual and male, these things are advantageous. Well, he says, well, empirically, the black heterosexual male stereotype leads to disadvantages. A decade later, and I actually want to read this piece uh, out to you, um, and I'll kind of give it given the, the notions that we have the privilege that come out of heterosexual. Um, Athea Matua, uh, who was at first an intersectionality theorist uh, in the late 90s, or early 90s, and has recently started to start gesturing toward multidimensionality, makes this argument. She says, when intersectionality was applied to black men, it was initially interpreted to suggest that black men were privileged by gender and subordinated by race. That is, black men set the 
intersection of the subordinated and oppressive system of race and the criminal system of gender. Intuitively, this notion seemed correct. It also seemed to support the dominant social and academic practice of examining the oppressive conditions that black men face from a racial perspective. Yet, the interpretation of black men as privileged by gender and oppressed by race appeared incorrect in our observations of racial profile. While this interpretation of intersectionality seemed to capture some of the differentials between women and men in the black community, as in wage differentials, for example, it did not capture the harsher treatment black women seem to face, not only in the context of anonymous public space that often characterized her as crime following, but also in terms of higher rates of hyper-incarceration, death by homicide and certain diseases, suicide rates, and high unemployment as compared to black women. So now, so here we see the problem that I've been gesturing towards all night, which is that there is an abstract calculus being performed that does not simply parallel empirical reality. In other words, given that the categories of intersectionality suggest something like black men can be subordinated by race and privileged by, by, by gender, right? As if these, notice, these are categorical distinctions. It's not like black men experience that privilege in a material and actual society. It's not like migrant men experience this in a material and actual society. It's not an indigenous issue, right? The question is, when you have to verify or test it, you can't seem to find the privilege that's the point of males. So going back to the, the question I asked the audience in the beginning, how do you know where race begins and gender, or race ends and gender begins? If the question, if you're studying black men and they die, they die earlier, they're incarcerated more, they commit homicide, they're, they're, they're victims of homicide and suicide more, then, and they're educated less, how do, how do we understand what part is race and what part is gender? Right? And, and notice, when we're, when we're talking about black women, notice what, notice what we do when we talk about our, what I call our preferred subject. You say that black women's experience is simultaneous. They simultaneously explain, they, they, they experience race and gender. They experience both marginality and empowerment. Right? Everything for them happens within, as a social being. But then when other subjects like migrant workers, migrant men, black men, say the same thing, you say, oh no, your experience can't be trusted. But your experience is the disempowerment of race and the unperceived benefits of gender. So the experiential copyright that one has to their life story or even the sociological condition they exist in don't exist for all the other subjects that happen to not be the black woman. Whereas the black woman gets a kind of authorship of her own experience. And I'm not trying to say that black women shouldn't have authorship of their own experience. I'm completely fine with that. But the question becomes, well then when other groups' experiences, say the intersection of being black, male, worker, or migrant, or even prisoner, right? When those experiences come up with a different form of knowledge, is that knowledge dismissed because their bodies don't conform to what is the intersection of something. So how do we compare two phenomena? And in the world where, in my case, because I study black males, there's not a language to describe homoeroticism. There's not a language to describe black male depression and suicide. There's not a language to describe the fact that in every demographic category, right, that black men seem to be falling under black women uh, sociologically. So people don't know how to explain it because the only language that they were given is privilege. Whereas my work suggests that if you look both historically and empirically, you see massive amounts of black male vulnerability and even concrete disadvantage. Okay, Dr. Curry, I think that was deep. Um, responses? If not, then I'll, I'll again segue uh, something um, so I can remember. The point that's being made is, I mean, this is, this is my own kind of um, um, dissatisfaction. Notice, another category Dr. Curry just added was prisoner, right? Incarcerated versus free. If you think of the endless things that we can add to the mix, the calculus, and then just come up with different, um, different kind of pictures, right? But if we 
take the Eurocentric model of each category as a given, then gender is rigid. It just doesn't apply to black males. So this is the David Marriott is a black British theorist who escaped to America. And he this is a particularly his point. Um, and I, I would uh, and I will always want to make this point. Within black studies, black feminism, black queer theory, this conversation is already happening. So a black queer feminist like Zakia Johnson is speaking about the the work of a David Marriott, and she's not chiding them for the why you just talk about black men, but she's they're having an internal conversation on what, how gender and how um, sex uh, historically have been uh, barred from from even entering into a conversation in the, on, the, on the black body. Uh, how Norman does it within black queer theory, theory. how queer, queer theory cannot apply to black to blackness under an ontological situation of anti-blackness. But how he says um, quite provocatively in sex, how Norman. Black, the black queer does not exist, right? If you could think of anything that comes with the, the, uh, the primer of black, it's like a magnet, like they, they never, they never kind of connect. Because the, the queer is trying to explain a, um, a, a subject that is deviant or does not conform to the normative, whereas blackness is the very thing against everything that is normative to define. So when we talk about black queer, so we actually have a rigid conversation then to assume a kind of rigid category and have the changes. Um, so that's my point. And the other thing is, another black feminist like Joy James has spoken about the difference between what happens in these black homes, when we speak of black homes under the condition that black people have lived in the US, and what happens uh, recently within the states, right? So within white theory, we always talk about how the family mimics the nation state, so that patriarchy is kind of in, in both in both um, camps, so to speak. Within the black family, within the black family, that does that have existed. So patriarchy, uh, we cannot use something like patriarchy, which whiteness takes for granted, both in the family and in the nation, and apply it to uh, the black family, where the violence, the, 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 the violence actually is a result of the pathologizing um, kind of uh, constriction placed on the white slavery by racism and things like that. So that you cannot speak about again black patriarchy or black uh, this or black that black that, but you have to uh, kind of reject first of all the, the categories that are being labeled and look at the violence first, the structure that Curry is talking about first, rather than assume a given identities with which intersectionality can go into the field. Right? Intersectionality takes identities and speaks about them, whereas uh, the kind of analysis of the structure of the power structure or the violence. If we take that first, then the identities really they kind of disappear. We have, we have nothing to work with. And I think that's why Curry's work is so important in terms of empirical um, uh, research. He, he's picking out all these various moments in the history of um, black struggle where there has always been diversity in terms of uh, um, leadership roles and things like that, but also uh, different self conceptions or conceptions of the self. Didn't conform to European Eurocentric models. Um, I'm going to stop speaking because I want Curry to speak particularly to uh, African centered woman, woman's work, Oyeronke uh, Oyewumi, uh, who speaks about this very point. I think she, her work gets to the very core of this because she identified the problem as being the biocentric notion that is, uh, of what, we, what makes male male and female female, which only exists in the West. Which cannot be kind of um, applied to the rest of the world. So if you could speak about Oyewumi's work, Dr. Kerr, um, and go back to the very point of how we assume a biocentric notion of gender with which intersectionality plays, so to speak, but never questions. Did you get that? I don't know if you lost me. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I think I lost you a little bit there. Okay, could you speak to uh, Oyomumi's work? Can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Could you speak to Oyomumi's work in terms of yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the, the Western conception of gender sure. as being very, very at the core of this intersectionality that it doesn't challenge it, it just moves with it, moves with it, so to speak? Yeah, I think, I think that, I think one of the problems that Generally, happened when we were talking about 
intersectional theory is we assume that the categories will speak Keanu or Nash, right? Um, just really quickly, my show of hands, how many people here have heard that race is a social construct? Okay. How many people here have heard that gender is a social construct? All right. Now, let me ask these questions. When we speak of race or gender, do we associate that with certain bodies? Yes. Yes. Show your hands. Yes. Right. Now, this is only Wumi's point. Only Wumi argues that we suggest that things like race and gender are socially disruptive, meaning that they're cultural phenomena. They're what we've created and what we learn to call things. Right? Uh, like money is a social construct. We invented it, and then we invented a certain economy that gave it down. Right? And only Wumi says this is the same thing that happened with race and sex. But, she says, despite that analysis, race and sex seems to be heavily tied to a biological conceptualization of the body. So when I asked the question again about rape at the beginning of the session, and how we spell explain it, like no rape or no rape in general, one of the reasons for hesitation is because you don't have a biological conceptualization of how rape happens on your bodies. Because we think that rape necessarily means penetration in a female body. So only when we tries to show us that despite our concepts and our rhetoric of social construction, in reality, in the West, sex, and to a certain extent, race, speak to biological designations of human body. Now, from this analysis, she argues that that is a perpetuation of Western epistemology. So, quite contrary to how black feminists and post structuralists argue that the focus on the body is liberating, Oyumumi argues that the focus, or what she says, is a somatic epistemology, which means what we see, uh, is in fact very Western. The argument she uses for that is, think of the arguments that Europeans made about their perception of African, Indian, Asian, Korean peoples, indigenous peoples. They saw a difference physically, so they attribute to that physical difference certain moral or epistemological or cultural uh, significance. Right. That is the foundation of where Maria Lucunes um, picks up the argument about the European the Eurocentrism of the gender category. She makes building off of Oye Ruby, she's arguing that gender is very specific. It only refers to white women. Now other people were savages. Now other historians have also made this point. Uh, people like Yale Biederman, for instance who showed that in the 19th century, black men and black women, because they were not of a white race, were not thought of to be human or gender. Now, it's important to understand the distinction there. If you're not a human being, let's say you're a dog, right? No one thinks about, nobody calls female dogs ladies, right? Nobody says that's a woman just because of their gender. In the 1800s and the early 1900s, the same thing was the case for black people in America and other colonial peoples throughout the world. This is why colonial people were thought to be the ladies of the races, if you look at someone like Louis Mike Thomas, or what she referred to in 19th and early 20th uh, century literature as children. Now that means that when we choose a gender category, like woman, right, we're actually revising history so that it applies to them. And notice the fact that so during slavery, where anyone or black people literally were the objects of white sexual lust. They could do anything they wanted to. We now have, because of the gender category, the idea that patriarchy somehow existed amongst all male slaves. In this country, for instance, the art I have had really did at conferences, and there are publications that say people like Frederick Douglass, who was born in slavery, was a patriarch. There are arguments that people like W.B. E. B. B. Du Bois was a patriarch, right? There, because of the gender category and how we understand males, people simply assert that even black people who are enslaved were patriarchs. Now, people like Andrew Davis 
Prince and other historians of slavery have certainly dismissed this as silly, right? Say that patriarchy almost likely will never grow within the slave system. But nonetheless, you can see the effects that a categorical revision like their male has to the position they're in, which is still enslaved. These are the two major points that people like Maria Lutunez, Onwumi, and Gail Biederman make regarding how we understand race and sex in the 19th century. And this is especially important because if we make arguments suggesting that there is such a thing as black male privilege or these different male privileges amongst indigenous and migrant groups, then I think that it's a very prudent question to ask, well, when did those male privileges start, given that by white men and white women, these very same women were, cho- were, were treated and defined as children, uncivilized, undeveloped, and in some cases, even female. Right? So these designations, and it's, and it's important there because notice that they're being defined by a sexual designation, not a gender designation. So one of the reasons that colonial theorists are arguing that it's so easy for white men to go into colonial spaces and use them to look these arrows was because they thought that all of the savages were sexually blue and of the female type. So they didn't see it as violating or having an implication to their sexuality. Right? It's only what we named it today because we said that a white colonial male from Britain had sex with, you know, a young Filipino boy, that that's one more promising. Right? But that's our name for a phenomenon that wasn't perceived at that time as that. In that case, it was simply sexual lust of the biblical economy and what we would call rape. It was a demonstration of superior race to an inferior race, which always had sexual components of body style too. Right? Okay. So that changes how we think about the universal application of gender given those historical realities. Okay, I think that's a brilliant uh, summation. Um, I want to take it back to the it's nine o'clock, people are joining. And, um, and if, if, if you're feeling a bit weird about all the names he's throwing out in terms of like so-so said this, so-so said that, the idea of DL is to bring this to you in terms of like sessions or sessions to speak about the particular Contributions of this black feminist and that black woman and that black this and that, that that will all come kind of together because it's almost impossible to do this live online and kind of jot down all these names, right? That's, that's what I wanted to say. Um, I don't know if Dr. Curry wants to give like a summary, but before that, if anybody has questions or comments or uh, objections, because I want to I want to poke Dr. Curry, I really to to, to test him. <laughs> Because I want to make this section like it feel really infallible. Because it feels to me that it is infallible. Uh, just the very fact that I'm a male, and I have a male on screen speaking, critiquing something that came out of black women, I already think that people assume this is bullshit. Like, how could you do this? Of course they're going to not like it. But what I'm trying to, to do is kind of bring the diversity of black women's contributions to the very idea. And what came around it, like, I always think that this sexuality happened in 1989, or came out in 1989, and we were still talking about intersectionality. It's like NWA came out in 1986. Today I'm still talking about NWA. But like, I imagine like one band is on top of the chart forever, like 25 years. Nothing came before, nothing, nothing came after. I think there's, and more personally, I think in the UK, given the idea of political blackness, I worry that non black women of color have celebrated intersectionality more than black women here. Right? They received it and ran with it. And nobody even looks back to see what came after it from black women. Because black women are still being killed. Black men are still being killed. Um, so, test the men, please, so we can speak about it more, especially if you're black women. Oh, if, if I may say one thing. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, oh, again, okay, yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think I think that I, I know that intersectionality rises or, or raises a lot of sentiment, and you know what we what we largely refer to as identity politics in this country. But if you would just bear with me one moment, just take a thought experiment. Um, think of how incredibly reductionistic it is to suggest that there's only one theory and one model that all black women for the last two hundred years have suggested and endorsed as their theoretical contributions to the world. Um, think of any other group of people, um, be they black, they're, they're black men, 
white men, white women, etc. But they are only known for one thing. Uh, the reality of the world is that black women were social and historical beings. They made great contributions to the political world as well as in terms of knowledge and epistemology. That, however, does not mean that the way that we encapsulate 200 years of intellectual and political activity on our planet is by one word. And that is my argument that black women like Claudia Jones, like Maddie Gordon, like Anna Judy Cooper, Ida B. Wells, and Dale Hunt, Gertrude Moore, or the little old Burns, these were women who were of their time. So they made some of the same mistakes that the men of their times did, but they also had a very incredible and profound insight. And those women are never spoken about. Because if these women that we study don't agree with the theoretical and ideological position of the academy, they are erased. And one of the biggest problems that I have uh, in the United States is that no matter how many black women, like I published articles on Ida B. Wells showing that she was a, a, a ardent supporter of violence and notes and self-defense. And I said that I, that I published a subsequent article showing that this was one of the influences behind um, Robert F. Williams' program, Women Be Global Dunks. So I'm trying to show that there is an inheritance of arguments from black women to black men and black men to black women. But because it doesn't fit with how we traditionally view black women, which are reformist and democratic liberal political subjects, people have a problem with the paper, even though no one's been able to refute it. So intersectionality and our view and our need for black women to be participants has led to a reduction and collapse of black women's intellectual areas because we try to make them only associate with other black women and make them ahistorical in the sense that they were not conversant with the theories and phenomena of their time. Uh, I think our challenge is if we're truly interested in understanding oppression and history, to make sure that we account for black women in that history, not as perfect subjects, but as thinking human beings, which means they're both successful and triumphant as well as small. Thank you. That was the summation, basically, that was the summary. So if you have questions before you go, anything lingering, things that are in your mind. Uh, one here. So everybody who has a question, raise your hand so then we can count it, give it to the man, and then we'll finish. We have one here. And that's it. Okay, just remember, I also want to say, so people can stop going home. Uh, there's another hour and a half discussion between me and myself and on the podcast, uh, White MD. You go to at White, V I T, D Colonial. Just to listen to it. Um, uh, and and the, the link to the article that you wrote, which all these people have uh, cited, is on the website for the, this event. So, the, one comment, and then we'll call it a day, Doctor. Um, yeah, could you please write me some stuff by my time to clarify? Um, so, in the days of that woman's life, when she um, may have um, experienced violence from a black man, that is not patriarchy, what that is is, or that is white supremacy, um, or that is the white supremacy or kind of white patriarchy that has been imposed upon um, black people or people of colour. Um, I heard part of that. So, so the like question, the question is, or what, what is black, or what is black experience and mostly violence in the hands of black men? Is that not patriarchy? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's kind of stuff. Is that not, this is, um, what are you saying? When a black woman suffers violence at the hand of a black man in the home or in the domestic, uh, in the domestic um, scene, then are you saying that's not patriarchy, but rather that's white supremacy or white supremacist patriarchy that has imposed itself onto the, uh, the black home under conditions of white supremacy? Oh, no, no, look, I, I don't think we actually have to get that theoretical with it. The reality is the theory that you're articulating, uh, the idea that men dominate women um, because they're men, is a theory you could call the Duluth model that was created by Ellen Parks. In 1999, before Ellen Parks died in the early 2000s, she wrote an article called My Philosophy, where she says that the Duluth model, or the idea that men beat women based on domination, was created as an ideological justification for the Violence Against Women's Act in the United States. She says that actually the data they have from the clinical studies did not support that men beat women or were even aware that they were seeking domination 
and that the clinicians were instructed in clinical cases to tell me that the reason they would be viral was because of unconscious lust for domination. She also said that the creation of the theory, they excluded the cases of child abuse and female abuse of men. So this is just based on her own testimony in 1999 the conclusion article that domestic violence was caused by environmental factors that range from poverty, drug and substance abuse, to mental depression. Now, that account and her revision to her original theory for the new file is much more in line with how contemporary social workers and sociologists, as well as psychologists, they need to be back up to the abuse, especially in the black community, in the community. So in the United States, for instance, there's a phenomenon called sexuality, where you have violence in homes that are stigmatized, where you have women hit, men escalate, women get injured, and then men get convicted. Because in this country, it's very difficult to get any mental services or social work services to men who are victims of rape or domestic abuse. So it's largely untreated, right? So I think that the empirical evidence simply shows us that domestic violence is another kind of viral violence. And when you look at poor you know, neighborhoods, when you look at poor sectors of society, those sectors have more violence. And rather than being a specific type of gender, right? Because notice what we do. We'll, we'll say that in poor sectors of society, when people kill each other, well, that's just, that's power. But you move that very same power where people hit each other and kill each other in the streets to inside the home. Oh, no, that's not power anymore. Now that's gender, right? See, this, this is that aspect I'm talking about. How we make conceptual jumps and connections between social phenomena that's not really justified by the phenomena itself. But can um, I just I mean, I'm just talking about Terry. What? But given your own analysis or you, you're pushing a comparison, isn't it true that statistically speaking, black women do suffer more uh, violence as, um, um, uh, events at the hands of black men? Comparatively speaking, it's just statistically true that they do. Like, you mean like across all the society? About specifically black women. Like, I mean, but like, you mean like in a home? Yes. Because like, like, it, it changes. Exactly. So I'm talking about in uh, domestic violence cases, black women uh, are the victims more so than black men are the victims. And at the hands of black men, isn't that true? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, cases. In the United States, the cases for the last several years. I mean, that's what I'm saying, it changes. So in 1976 to 1989, black men were the largest victims of being killed by a hand like a hand into a part of a homicide. From 1990 to now, black women are serving the majority of cases killed by a into a part of a homicide. The problem is we don't know how to measure into a part of violence because if you look at it in terms of unilateral violence, meaning a woman hits a man, that's about 30% of the cases. If you look at it in terms of men hits a woman, then that's about 60, 65% of the cases. But social workers argue that in cases of what we count as unilateral male violence, 62% of the, all those cases are by direction, meaning that women hit and they've been estimated. So there's no way that we can truly tell outside of what clinicians are giving us um, as the actual cause of violence amongst black and brown people because they have such different effects. But the, that, the, natural, the natural response was then even if the woman hits the man, he should not hit back. Uh, that would be the natural response to, to that argument, even if it happens. They should, he shouldn't hit back, period. So it's always hit that. Well, I, I mean, everybody has their personal politics. I just think the real world doesn't work that way. I mean, if people, if a woman can kill a man, and a man chooses to defend himself, or if a man's been involved from childhood in traumatic situations, you know, our, our sentiments of class around and mother that should never be attacked may not hold for some of these rules. Overwhelmingly, domestic violence is a class phenomenon. It happens amongst poor populations, incarcerated populations, and populations with drug and substance abuse. So it suggests that these people who have serious traumas and different addictions in their lives are morally bad beings um, because they hit women despite women hitting them. I'm just, I'm not that type of scholar. I, I think that Bob should be arrested for most people of color every instance. I, 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 I would have been probably uh, following the I got you, I got an answer. I was kind of cheating. I was forcing you to think only for in the black family, but the, uh, the idea is in any pathologized community there will be more violence. 
and we should be focusing particularly in the black community as being particularly violent more than any others. I get that. But I think that's, that last part yeah. has got more common. I, I got you. I'm, I'm with you, okay. Uh, I think there's more comments. Right? Over here and over here. Oh, yeah, hold on. I don't want to go to the mic. Okay. A couple more comments and then we'll go. Thank you, Dr. Curry. Um, I wanted to speak to what you just yes, spoke to about here and um, also to ask you something a bit more about um, critical race theory as a, as a, a field journey. But first, with respect to that comment, um, one could argue that um, black women face more violence in the home from black men uh, in, in comparison to, let's say, violence in the home between uh, a, a, white, a white family. Because, um, I don't know if this is the word, black women as a, as a, as a, as a subject, as a, in, we're not afforded that position of, of female, so therefore, if, instinctually, to, to be a black woman is not, not considered to be uh, the, the kind of moral taboo mm -hmm. there is about beating mm -hmm. other um, women uh, of different races. And so, this is seen particularly in. Um, uh, just out, even outside of the black family, although that was where this discussion was being uh, had, um, the violence that black women face in the world generally, so uh, rates of um, a violence against from, from police, from uh, violence in the street, uh, whether it be all, all responses, and this kind of discussions about microaggressions, which arguably just aggressions, just the representations of white supremacy, um, you know, in this sort of everyday form. Um, that black women as a, as a sort of a, a subject face that kind of violence, and even even from our own people, even from our own men. So you have this discourse of misogyny, uh, misogyny, uh, black, uh, black anti-black uh, female um, sentiments, um, and because of the way in which the uh, white supremacy gender or well, creates the subject of black. And then black women then being subjugated again by not being able to fit into that, that spectrum of, of female. And so, I mean, um, although the discourses around uh, um, uh, Michelle Watts' book are you know, very, very dodgy, uh, the, kind of, the, the, the kind of things that are, are pointed to there in respect to, um, uh, you know, for example, Elvis Dreamer says in, in in solar life, you know, he instinctually doesn't feel attracted to other black women the way he's attracted to white women because the world is built to valorize white femininity and necessarily denigrate black uh, female, um, uh, the black female body. And so she is hypersexualized and asexualized together. And lots of black feminists have put their work is, is, is looking at this and they're trying to understand how that looks into the world. Um, people that I respect as well, that Sylvia Winter that you, you've spoken about, um, looks at that as a discussion about the human in of itself, that we have this, this category of who is it to be human that's been created. It's not a biological um, category the way that the world pretends it is, but while it's a constructed category that necessarily means the white male, mm -hmm. that's who we really mean as human. And anything that comes close to that can then be incorporated into that space of a white female, you know, although she faces some sort of a, uh, subjection because she's not a white boy from male, she nonetheless very things to be incorporated in that. But the, the, the native peoples and the blacks specifically are the absolutely normative, denigrating other. And in that role today as well, the, the black female um, faces a very specific type of, of um, violence. And that's kind of where I see, I I, 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 I I'm, I'm just to say about myself, I, 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 never really understood the sexuality because of the question, second question I want to ask with respect to um, maybe I don't know if you tie this together but um, critical race theory as a, as a subject is to look at the way in which um, the US legal system and society generally is, is a white supremacist society and that can intrinsically racism is not sort of a or something that happens sometimes and we've got to change the world but rather is, a, is the everyday sort of racial realism that this is the world that we live in that it, it cannot count cannot bring justice to black people. The legal system and arguably mm -hmm. critiques you know, what the law does because you know, from the outset slavery was legal you know, and Jim Crow were, uh, were illegal and all these sort of uh, legal reforms that we had from the civil rights movement onwards have not led to the material benefit of black people's lives and anything that led to um, and, and every single just, you know, um, social chance has led to um, um, uh, 
life being worse. And so when I looked at intersectionality as a, as a discourse explaining the black women's you know, situation in the legal system, it, it seeks to try and say these are ways in which black women can be incorporated in the, uh, the legal system. But if critical race theory as, as, a, as a field basically says that this is impossible, this cannot happen, and Derek Bell's work has sort of charted this whole sort of all new reasons why the legal system cannot do this, then what is the point of intersectionality? Right. What's the relationship between critical race theory and intersectionality? So a little question. Sorry, Dr. Kerr, we can take all the questions at once, so we have uh, uh, about the yeah. and to Yusuf and yeah. John. Hello, um, my name is Lisa. Uh, um, Lisa, can you answer? Anyway, I'm just thinking here about all the um, black feminism as a, as a black woman. I think it's just, for me, it's always the gender that um, comes first. I was watching this really interesting uh, documentary, I think it was a head-to-head -head program on Al Jazeera, saying that Arab men hate Arab women. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought, I just instantly thought, yeah, I know, men hate women. And that's what I feel. Feel growing up here, but also having these spaces um, in Smyrna, Smyrna land, um, that men innately, there is this just growing up being told that you're better than a woman. And it's a real kind of psychological and just very, um, very difficult. I don't think women talk, you know, I don't think it's researched enough, I don't think it's talked about enough, that there is this, this just kind of knowing that you're just less. Um, so for me, it's always been, that comes first growing up, and then the race part came later in terms of employment, education, where it was like my brothers and my you know, cousins or what have you, they were expected to have the high-flying financial you know, careers. The men could make it, whereas I'm kind of, if she makes it, you know, well, kind of a bit, but they, they believe in you, but it's, it's a different kind of belief, you know, believability because you're a woman. Um, and I really think that psychological aspect of males, regardless of race, really, just thinking that they're better. And I've always been, for me, I've really kind of seen that just growing up with, with males and being very much kind of tomboy and just seeing the, just the, the sheer, just, not bravado, but just, you know, belief, and I really, really wonder where that comes from. Um, and for me, this sort of really, you know, it goes further in terms of employment. If you see, uh, I think it was like 88% of women in the UK um, are, are mostly in care work, so for instance, working in the NHS, or, you know, work which involves caring. You know, it's a, a slimmer amount of women that work in the city, that work in um, you know more creative arts. It's mainly male because we're not told that you can do that, um, and that psychological burden, I would say, and ability to not have those aspirations. When actual fact, you know, we're in London. Apparently, this is a place where you can be and do anything. But if from the offset you're given a full start, I really don't know where I'm supposed to go. So anyway, that's something. Okay, just one more question, and then two more. Okay, can you take five? No, 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 I'm talking. That's right. One, two, three, four. Okay. Oh, you okay? You want to go at the first two and then the next two? But that'll be it. Okay. All right, that'd be great. So the first one is how do we reconcile the aim of critical race theory with the method of intersectionality? Uh, how do we reconcile the aim of critical race theory with the method of intersectionality? Uh, and and also uh, and the second one I think goes hand in hand with Buddha's first one in terms of how uh, black women actually, I mean, it's a very good point. If the Eurocentric model of categories is, is taken for granted, then those hierarchies that are constructed in the name of those categories should also be taken seriously, meaning the hierarchy of black women finds itself at the bottom. Um, sure, sure. And, and um, I forgot her name. And he says speak from experience. Can you the first question for me there? First question is, how do you reconcile the uh, aims of critical race theory in terms of how Derek Bell theor uh, thinks of the, right. the permanence of racism all over society? 
and uh, how uh, we've reconciled that with the method of uh, intersectionality because it needs to yeah. be integration. Yeah, I want to make sure I understand. Um, you can't. So, <laughs> Derek Bell's theory of racial realism is that regardless of what political activities you do in colonial or semi-colonial economies, whatever you lead back to the same result, right? So here's an example of like the political rights movement. All movements give you peaks of progress and then they, they go down when white interests are threat. Intersectionality is built off a of coalition model. So when you look at Kimberly Crenshaw's you know, article, and even Patricia O'Connor's article, and Mary Masuda's supportive article, the idea is that you can build multicultural um, female leadership coalitions um, across racial boundaries that will lead to democratic change. Uh, those two notions, intersectionality is a liberal theory. It is based on integration sentiment and political recognition. Uh, this is Peter Kwan's argument, right? That the assumption is that if we recognize black women as both black and female, then that lets us recognize more options for liberatory political practices. So now that I know that you're not just black and you're female, I have to consider other things that address the femininity of your positionality that should increase your freedom. Uh, and that's just not the case in this political system. So I mean, I think we look at things like Sandra Blonde, um, or Sandra Bland in, you know, in Texas, that happened 45 minutes away from where I live. And you can see that the practice of her being killed by a police officer is the exact same as what happens to hundreds of black men. In this country, every year, about 300 black men are shot and killed by police officers. Uh, about 20 or 30 are called black women are killed every year uh, that we have knowledge of. So it suggests that uh, in this instance, uh, gender doesn't create the same kind of protection for violence. It may lessen the occurrence of it, like you're not uh, as high in the number of males, but you can certainly be treated the same way. So I think that intersectionality has a lot of explaining to do about why social phenomena seems to affect everyone within racial groups the same, and you can't really point to causality and gender, right? So I, I don't think those two theories are really compatible if we're being honest about what Eric Bell is trying to do with what intersectionality uh, truly is in terms of political power. Um, in terms of the hierarchy question, I'm really glad you, you asked that question. Um, again, I think this is how social phenomenon breaks down on what we hold universalized categories of phenomena. So, for example, in the United States, and I'll just use that as that because I'm more familiar with the data, um, black girls don't for all thinking they've achieved more uh, than black women. Uh, in fact, the studies we've had for the last four decades uh, suggest the exact opposite. Uh, because black men since 1954, or actually since the turn of the century, have not had access to schools the way that black women have in the United States. So the effect that this has concretely is that over 70% of black men work, work in blue collar jobs in the United States, whereas only 7% of black women do. So it means that overwhelmingly in the United States, black women work in white labor, white uh, collar jobs, and they get over 70% of the degrees here. So, the question that I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you generally in the sense that I think that if you take white patriarchal culture, then sure you're going to have this cultural sentiment that women are inferior to men. But in other cultures where men are primarily seen as workers, so even if you look at you know, Latino culture in this country, uh, it's very similar. Men are considered to be blue collar. Uh, many of the complaints that you get from upper class educated black women in the United States is that they actually, they actually lose money if they marry a black man. And this is what I mean when I said we need to know context, right? So because of the story of Maine, it's estimated that to marry a black male in this country will cost a black woman $25,000 per year. So given that reality, we have to adjust what we claim male privilege and patriarchy actually are based on the specific cultural and ethnic circumstances that uh, groups of people will live in. Right? And, and it suggests a fraction, right, of, of patriarchy. It says that not all males participate in patriarchy. They're certainly not recognized by these systems, right? It's not like people are hating jobs for black men. Right? We have lots of black women who are employed. And in this country, for instance, black men are the most unemployed group and in fact, are the only racial group where men are more unemployed than women. So, I, all I'm arguing, I'm not saying that patriarchy is not a problem. I'm saying that it, it required, we have to adjust it such that we create nuanced analysis rather than these universal rules that really don't hold true here. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Uh, two I, more I, questions. Can I just add? Yeah. Given the US context, I was speaking from the UK. Yeah. The, 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 
she's saying the context she was giving was more local uh, rather than the US. Uh, so maybe statistics don't bear that. Yeah, and, and again, that's why I use the US example because that's kind of my reality. But like, like I said, I think, I, I, I think it questions universality. It doesn't mean that it's not important, it's not a factor. But we have to look at, you know, like in my work, I talk about racism for same Andrew. Like the idea that black men are criminals, the idea that black men are rapists, uh, the idea that black men are natural misogynistic, right? We have, we have over, de- we have four decades of data that shows that that's not true. But those stereotypes are used to justify things like job discrimination, criminalization, and incarceration. So it's, it's kind of a question of nuance, like how, how do we factor in these things? Okay. Well, like, I, I mentioned in the podcast, I checked the, so I can give the context. UK context, 2014 and 2015, uh, both in education and employment within the Afro Caribbean and African uh, community. Black men are uh, less employed than black women and have less educational success than black women. And the Asian community is different. It's, uh, compared to the white uh, community, there's a big gap. But actually, black, uh, the Asian men, and they always give you the white Asian community, Pakistani, Bangladesh, uh, and they don't include Chinese for no good reason. But with the Asian uh, context, there is a difference between uh, male and female types of jobs, leaning towards men. Compared to white, that's, like, there's, no, there's no comparison. But in the black community specifically, there is a, there is a gap which is similar to what he's talking about. And, uh, her, um, and in the American context, I should also add, the post-colonial immigrant who is African or, or the Caribbean who arrives in America does better than the native uh, black American who is descendant. But the second generation does, does the worst of all immigrant groups. Does that make sense? So the South African blacks who arrive in America during the 60s and 70s or even Canada who do better than the native blacks of their children do worse than any other immigrant group. Um, people from the Afro pessimist camp, like Frank Wilson, was contributed this to a big global anti blackness that is more working libidinally in terms of white people's desires and non black people's uh, aggressions than uh, just merely economic factors. But um, I just wanted to say that. Two more questions. Yeah, hi. Go ahead. No, any questions? Comment on anything really far. Just sending some love from London straight up to you, brother, and love to the organizers for doing this. And I heard the sister speaking about how um, she probably like, men in love. I just want to say for the record, we love you. Because it is, yeah, just a bit ignorant at the moment, because obviously through the um, process of a couple hundred years of taking on systems that are not religiously armed, I guess, we kind of, um, treat you in that way and I can only give an example for myself because I actually run an organization myself and uh, for years I used to do a thing where I don't piss fight, I don't piss pump girls, I don't start girls, I'm just going to do it, give you a kiss on the cheek like that. And I met a sister and I met she was like an organizer and she's a real organizer. And um, when I kind of pulled my hand away, because she went to spite me, she kind of looked at me funny, you know. And that's kind of analyzed afterwards because I did feel the way because, um, yeah, I guess it's kind of, it's um, kind, of, kind of sexist kind of attitudes kind of coming through in my actions kind of subconsciously, I guess, because uh, she is an equal and I'll be honest, the majority of the people that are in our, in our organization are female, you know, and if we, um, as people who are in our organization, in our community, um, don't raise their women um, in the organization. We're going to better ourselves and better our community because um, women are the backbone of any community, any family, any society. And if you don't value the women, you know, you're lost. So you've got to step away from that kind of Western value of um, the women are kind of subservient. And yeah, we got the emphasis in our queens. Okay, that was, thank you. That was more of a comment and a big one. <laughs> uh, last question, Joseph. Yeah, um, 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 what I wanted to ask was about, um, oh, what was <laughs> I wanted to ask basically about, um, 
because people have become so decentralized, especially in digital spaces, I think generally black people recognize that they have to push back against um, an idea of intersectionality. It's like they have to push back against it because of the way that it's used anyway. So my question to you is, um, because I feel like when I'm listening to you, I also feel like um, I remember this uh, old when you said how um, when it comes to sexuality, it kind of makes use of these abstract categories like, of, um, of categories and kind of generalizes them like you know men, ma man, male, female, woman, um, and um, I'm and I'm starting to think though that you also um, have your own abstract categories, which is like you keep, you keep saying social phenomena, and um, and I'm wondering what makes you think that's not an abstract calculus, and also. Um, when you are saying things like, oh, we need to kind of um, analyze and, and study um, social phenomena such as the white man, um, things like that, well, my question is, um, then are you making a move from um, framework to kind of privileging methodology? And my question, I guess, is, well, should we also, like, because you keep mentioning these data and kind of like privileging like statistics and things like that, well, do you think that kind of, do you think statistics themselves um, are already embedded in this um, recreating a sociality, which um, doesn't kind of deal with the, the I don't know how to say this, but like immaterial violence, I don't know, like the violence that we can't measure, right? So, uh, so because, uh, I don't know, the basic question I guess I have for you is like, I keep this thing and the, I keep getting in this like idea that yes, we can intersectionality in this problems, yes, we have to do this, but how do we move away from this thing? So this constant need to kind of be like, oh, well, men have this too, well, people, um, other people have this too, and um, and and kind of like create a um, from this study of social phenomena to create this truth. Well, then, how do we, my question is, well, how do we challenge the truth that recreates itself to um, ensure that these structures hurt us, right? And um, that's one question I have. And um, another question I guess I have is like, um, this is the, I think it's a complicated question, but it sounds basic, but it's like, where does that leave the black woman? Because I constantly, um, when you were talking, I kept hearing constantly like, oh, well, black men, well, black men, you make the, um, the, um, the analytical movement to kind of um, think about black men. I know you're working about that, but again, like, I just, I'm thinking like, where does that leave that woman? And when it comes to intersectionality, especially in these political spaces that like, we're, when we're trying to organize and freedom or liberation or whatever, um, I, I, um, the black woman is constantly, even with intersectionality, is always um, created, like, it's always pushed to the position of the answer. So when people say things like, well, um, you know, as a working class person, like, whatever, basically, but as a working class person, this is happening to me. But obviously, with black women, that's worse, right? And so that, you know, it's up to me. Like, I would recognize that as a continuation of anti-black violence, right? Because, as you said, like, it kind of reduces black women to um, a singular history and a singular epistemology, I guess. So, what does it, basically, does study of social um, phenomena, um, this privilege of empiricism, kind of, um, what is, where does that lead back from it, and does it not, this, uh, yeah. Did you get that, Dr. Kirk? Yeah, it was a long question, so could you summarize, please? So, I'll try to give it justice. Um, it's, when you focus on, when you basically make the move from intersectionality as a methodology to empiricism as a methodology, is, is there not something lost in um, focusing on statistics, given that um, the social phenomena that we're talking about, you and I, or Yusuf, are still the same kind of um, uh, Eurocentric structures anyway. So even the way we read statistics um, may be problematic. Um, given what we what we what we exist under in terms of white supremacy, I think that's kind of the first bit, like the, the move, and then the second, and, and what do we not then leave the black woman? Uh, where, where does that leave the black, uh, the black women when we make the move, the analytical move, using empiricism to study black men? Um, so that, I think. Okay, so let me yeah, 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 yeah. So at the same time. Uh, so the first question is. <laughs> so there's, there's like a delay. There is a delay. I want to, I want to give my friend uh, the, the chance to finish. Yeah. So, and also at the same time, where did um, this kind of. Um, also, this 
need to study, whether that be uh, the deliberation, the work to be asked to the need to study, yeah, to resist, to push back, to, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, in terms of like, this kind of studying and um, talking, yeah, this need to study and whether that be basically um, the work that we need to do to um, fight back. There's an overemphasis on the studying the subject or the object rather than um, liberation work, as so to speak. Uh, um, I think the last bit is just complicated a bit more, but it's more about really the method. The, the I think the method, the jump, the, the jump from intersectionality as a method to empiricism as a method, and a couple of those jumps to study the black male under that privilege of empiricism. Where does that lead the black woman? Okay, well, so the first thing is, is the, when intersectionality was first introduced from that name, uh, people like Patricia Hill Collins gave credit to that to a group of black female sociologists, uh, specifically Joyce Ladder and LaFrancis Rogers Rose. Uh, the reason that's important is because when you look at someone like Bonnie Gill, who writes, uh, you know, who's doing work on this, and the influential article Double Jeopardy, which first introduced the idea that you should study black women as race and sex, those people argued that empiricism was the way to do it. In fact, this is Patricia Hill Collins' argument against standpoint epistemology. Remember the quote that I read? She said that it's not enough to just experience something, you have to study social organization. Now, what I'm, what I'm actually suggesting is the rich formulation of how we study black women by black women sociologists that came up with intersectionality, if we call it that, from the 1970s forward. So there's not a risk for losing anything. It's just that in our post-structuralist world, we've defined experience and what people say as more as better more than the real world. This is a black female method, and that's what I mean when I say that intersectionality points to a subjective position rather than the complete analysis that black women have given us to study a certain problem. In fact, in Double Jeopardy, uh, the author suggests that if you want to make arguments about black women's subordinate position, you can't do so ontologically. Meaning you can't do it by definition. You have to do comparative studies to the specific group we're talking about. Right? And that's all I'm calling, that's all I'm calling, right? Um, in terms of empiricism and statistics, it's important to know that empiricism um, doesn't just mean statistics. Uh, empiricism is a method of acquiring knowledge through sense perception. Uh, that means observation, that can mean something like statistics, it can mean something like interviews, it can mean something like your actual experience. But the difference is, is that, that, that empiricism doesn't become a priori. It's not true just because I've experienced it. It becomes contestable, meaning that if you say something like a black woman's at the bottom of the, of the totem pole across the world, it's so important to say, okay, well, in what category? And you can test if a black man experiences something like sexual violence, domestic abuse, et cetera, then their experience matters just as much as black women's experience in terms of that phenomenon. I am not trying to pick a favorite subject. I am simply trying to argue that social phenomenon is not uniquely tied to gender, but rather concentrated by it. In other words, what I'm suggesting is a theory which argues that gender increases the propensities for certain types of violences, but is not uniquely causal of any. And I think that this kind of account is not only proven sociologically, economically, and historically, but it also fits conceptually. Meaning that I don't have to erase black men or black women or black children from domestic violence or rape or sexual abuse or economic marginalization. One of my job as a, as a philosopher and a theorist is to try to create a theory that explains all the social phenomena. So one of the reasons that I know so much about sociology, history, and economics is my job is to be able to explain the theory that explains all of that. And all, my only argument about intersectionality is not even doing that. In terms of the position of where the black woman ends up, the black woman ends up not as a subject of perfection. She ends up as a subject in relation to the rest of society. So that means just as black women are certainly abused uh, in terms of rape by domestic violence, 
they are also proportionally the greatest perpetuating that's democracy that's like it. That's not a moral condemnation. That's an argument for why we need to study female perpetration of violence against males and use black women as a test case to understand what causes it, right? And I think that that's what doesn't happen in terms of intersectionality now. Uh, and in terms of what that produces to, uh, on the end of liberation strategies, it allows us to actually understand the causes behind our world. If we start off with the premise that black women are the most oppressed, then we get a phenomenon like Carol Boyce Davis and Sylvia Sil- Sil- Winters talks about, where we don't analyze the class mobility and the political interest that many of these people have. If you look at Lane Brown's recent commentary of Ralph Flesh, she argues that in terms of black feminism, Condoleezza Rice would actually be the perfect icon. And that's a very dangerous sentence. Carolyn Boyce Davies backs up Lane Brown saying that in the United States, there's a very real class barrier where upper middle class black women who are educated in white institutions utilize gender in such a way to not pathologize black men, but distance themselves from what they perceive as pathologies of lower class black women. And for now it's where he calls this national bourgeoisie. So I think that an anti-colonial or decolonial analysis doesn't do anything to harm liberation strategies, but rather it points out how different class, religious, and racial sentiments are being internalized by certain classes of black people, both men and, and women, and why those aspects need to be studied and understood so that liberation can actually come about instead of just having representative uh, subjects to stand in for the suffering of people around them. This is the only beginning. Um, I agree. Like, um, there should be more of this. This is the only beginning. That's all I can say. Um, there's a lot of stuff that was left out. I think there's more questions to be to be had, to be posed. Huh? Part two, three. Part two, part three. Well, um, if Dr. Perry or Dr. Perry will have us, we'll do it again. But for now, we give him a hand. Thank you. 